This meeting is being recorded. I'm going to mute. Good morning, everybody. I guess we can say happy Memorial Day. <laughs> it can be a special occasion, a happy one. Before we start our service, uh, I would like to read something that Pastor had written for Memorial Day so we can all remember those that we've lost, our loved ones, and those we know and those we don't know. We want to remember them. This is a Memorial Day act of remembrance. Father, Son, and Spirit, teach us your language of life and mercy. Help us remember you and speak your words of love to those who grieve loved ones lost in wars so far away and to those who grieve loved ones whose lives were claimed by illness and accident. We remember our loved ones who have died. Please name silently or aloud those loved ones you remember today. O oh Lord, help us remember you and speak your words of love to hearts broken and futures shattered to enemies, the ones for whom we would rather not pray and for ourselves. Help us remember you and speak your words of love to lead us from prejudice to truth, to deliver us from hatred and revenge, to give us courage to overcome our fears. Help us remember you and speak your words of love to all the world which is in desperate need of your love. There are prisoners to be freed and hungry to be fed. Yes, we remember you, O Lord, the Trinity. Increase in us the gift of faith that our lives may reflect your glory and that we may make your love known. Amen. Before we begin our service today, I'd like to call upon Renee, and she's going to introduce our special guest. Dave asked me to be nice. <laughs> um, before we, before I begin my introduction of Dave, I'm going to. Uh, uh, remind everybody that we are having our circle meeting this Friday at 2.30. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so it is my honor to introduce uh, today uh, Bishop Emeritus Dave Mullen, who will be presiding. For those of you who don't know Dave, 40 years ago, he came to serve Calvary Lutheran as our pastor. During their 10 years here, Dave, his wife Sue, and the children, Heather, Sean, and Seth, they became beloved members of our family of faith. Then after 10 years here, Dave received another call to serve a congregation in Sacramento. And then we at Calvary were very proud, but not at all surprised when Dave became the bishop of our entire synod. Dave is going to preach for us today, but I wanted to warn you uh, that you need to be beware. Things have happened after Dave's sermons. Um, I've had firsthand experience of that. One beautiful, peaceful, very peaceful Sunday morning, as I sat listening to Dave, he admonished those of us lounging in the pews that it was up to us to change things in our neighborhood. We who sat there redeemed basking in God's love, we had responsibilities to friends, acquaintances, neighbors who did not know anything about God's grace. We were called not just to sit around reveling in God's provision for us, we were called to share our good news. And we know what that means by heart now because it's our, our mission statement. We are called to make God's love known. So apparently he, he had some influence in, in our uh, uh, mission statement as well here. But um, as we were, um, 
oh, okay, but then it got real. He pointed to Alice Bernie across our, uh, the school across our street right over here, and he said, right here at Alice Bernie School uh, are people from our own neighborhood. What can we do to serve them? And I was sitting there thinking, man, that would be a lot of work. Um, <laughs> But the Holy Spirit had obviously inspired Dave because I began to think our own son Brody went to that school and I realized that I already knew what they needed. The kids at Alice Bernie really needed a tutoring program. But I thought, oh, how are we ever gonna do that? I didn't wanna do that. I, I didn't even wanna think about it. So the next day, uh, you know, convicted and, and greatly against my will, I came in to see Dave and reluctantly I told him, okay, I, I heard what you said. I know what Alice Bernie needs. I really don't know how to do it. And then amazing things happened. In a remarkably short period of time with remarkably little work on my part, with the help of an inspired teacher and enthusiastic principal, we had a well-organized and sanctioned tutoring program at Calvary. That program, run by members of Calvary, served the students of Alice Burney for several years after that sermon. So now for the warning. I know that you will enjoy and be inspired by Dave's sermon today, but hang on to your hats. Well, she exaggerates some, I think. <laughs> but she's right about the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to ask my wife, Sue, to stand in case some of you here have not met her yet. She's put up with a lot over the years, and it's been really wonderful to have her, uh, even accompanying me as I go out. So it really is a, a joy and a pleasure to be here. I have a lot of memories of this place. I remember a lot of people from this place and uh, served here 10 years, which is quite a long time. And I'm really happy to be back here on this day, on Memorial Day weekend. And as we prayed already about those who have died, many in warfare and other ways, um, it's good to know about the grace of God and the Holy Trinity, God present with us always carrying us through even the worst. So, blessings to all of you. I wasn't here when Pastor was here, but uh, we are very blessed to have him come and serve and come back and share his stories with us, Renee too. Okay, we'll begin our service. Are there any more announcements? Okay, um, we are going to begin our service with our greeting and peace. Please stand. Oh, excuse me, I always forget the prelude. Poor, poor Jerry. Thank you. We have the prelude. I'll be back.
please stand for the greeting and peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Please share Christ's priest peace with one another. Christ, peace be with you, dear Marie. <clears throat> I love you dearly. Sit the pastor say hi to us. I do want to announce our service leaders for today. Uh, Pastor Mullen will be in the gospel and the uh, sermon. I'll be the lead assistant. Joe will be our assistant. And Dennis and Jerry are our music team, as usual. And Dennis is also going to be doing the reading for today. Pastor will do the bread, and I'll do the wine and for communion, and Joe will do the tray. So I think we're all set to go. Will you please stand for our opening hymn, which is Holy, Holy, Holy.
continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the creator of wind and rain, field and ocean, the bread of life coming down from above, the power at work within us and this world. Amen. Before God and the company of our sisters and brothers, let us confess our sin. God and Father of all, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have thought better of ourselves than others. We have told lies, said hurtful things, acted in ways we wish we could take back and look the other way when action was needed. In your mercy, O oh God, forgive us, cleanse us, and heal us. For the sake of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new in Christ. You are a new creation. Your sins are taken away, and you are made new. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen. We will now continue with our hymn of praise, My Lord of Light. Let us pray. Almighty creator and ever living God, we worship your glory, eternal, three in one, and we praise your power, majestic, one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith, defend us in all adversity, and bring us at last into your presence, where you live in endless joy and love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, now, please be seated, and we will have special music by Jerry and Dennis. So then I thought, well, something rousing might not be so significant. There were a couple of worship songs that I had heard and I liked. And you know I'm not fond of most modern uh, worship songs. We don't have music to give you because this was just written in, these were written in the last century. 
And so this week, Jerry did an arrangement for you to hear today. It's a calm, contemplative message about the Trinity and one of confession of sin. It's just simply a picture of the disciples. Dennis will be doing our being our reader today. Our first reading is from Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 8. This reading narrates Isaiah's vision of the Lord surrounded by angels. They sing, Holy, holy, holy a song the church sings at the beginning of the great thanksgiving. This liturgical text invites the church and all creation to sing in praise of God's glory. That glory is God's mercy towards sinners. A reading from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attention to him. Each had six wings. 
With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voice of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me the word of the Lord. Psalm 29, please read responsibly. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due God's name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hormon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord bursts forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord takes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Canaan. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying, glory. The Lord sits in front on the blood. The Lord sits as the king forevermore. The Lord gives strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessing of peace. Our second reading from Romans 8 verses 12 to 17. In describing the new life of faith, Paul refers to the three persons of the Trinity. The Spirit leads us to recognize that we are children of God the Father and sisters and brothers with Christ the Son. A reading from Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. You'll notice that we are reading this responsibly. You, of course, read the boldface print. 
Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, And Jesus answered him, Nicodemus said to him, Jesus answered, Jesus continued, Nicodemus said to him, Jesus answered him, Jesus continued. Jesus continued. And Jesus continued. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll say it again, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, truly. And a thank you to Renee for her kind words and to Mike and Renee both who offer us, Sue and I, such hospitality. Whenever we come to town, we stay at their house. They have a room upstairs that's now called the Bishop's Room. <laughs> Just in jest, of course, and incredible food to eat. It's just a pleasure being here. We've been friends for 40 years, so it's good. This is quite a Sunday, Holy Trinity Sunday. You all completely understand the concept of the Trinity, I'm sure, right? Yeah, sure. I'm kind of an amateur astronomer, and since I was so a young teenager, I was so interested in astronomy, and then as time has gone on, the discoveries, astronomical discoveries in the ever stronger telescopes, like now we have the James Webb telescope, and you can see vistas of billions of years back in time. It's just incredible. The immensity of the universe. Now, we have a sister galaxy called the Andromeda galaxy. And if you have a halfway decent telescope, you can see that if you have dark skies at your house. I don't have them at my house. The neighbors all have lights shining all night long, so it's kind of hard to see. But the Andromeda galaxy is just next door to us, uh, astronomically speaking. That means just uh, two and a half million light years away. And you know, uh, light travels at a rapid rate, but a light year is a long, long time. So we are seeing, when you see the Andromeda galaxy, it's this big, like, circular, egg-shaped, beautiful, beautiful and, uh, galaxy. 
like our galaxy would be if we were in outer space. I think about those two and a half million years. That's the light. We're seeing the light that comes to us from two and a half million years ago. Now, that's before human beings even existed. So, do we understand all this? When I was at seminary, I knew some of this stuff, and I was studying theology, and I kept trying to figure everything out. I got to get straight on all this stuff. And what happened? I got ever more depressed. I thought, surely I could figure all this out, and the wonders of the galaxy and all that. No way. It didn't happen. And I think, even though we confess our belief in God, the Holy Trinity, that created us and all that exists, we know that, we trust in that, but we may well wonder with the psalmist, Psalm 8, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? on this little speck of dust we call the earth. So, it's no fun being depressed, as many of you probably know. And so in that poem, there is both deep awe, great awe, and deep question. Kind of a pre-Nicodemus nagging concern about her place in the universe. Have you ever thought about the gall of Nicodemus, a Pharisee high up in the echelons of Judaism, sneaking to Jesus at midnight, the dark hour, with a bunch of questions, none of which Jesus really directly answered. But he was, I think, also concerned about, can this man be God? I think in a way he already knew who Jesus was or what Jesus was, the very God on earth, but he didn't dare say it. So he wanted to argue. So he had all these sort of college-level arguments for, for the Lord to try to answer. And some of it even ridiculous. Can a man be born again, go back to the birth canal and reappear? I mean, what's folly, so to speak? But we have this traditional language then about God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One and three, and three and one. We could go over here and have a discussion for several hours on that. Uh, wouldn't that be something? How do we understand this? We know something about God, that's for sure. But a lot of it's theoretically knowing something about God or just what we've been taught about God and we may have our doubts and our questions about it. That's far less than what Jesus actually offers us. That is to say, if we only seek the right and proper words about God, which is pretty popular in some circles today to keep hollering about God and words and how we ought to behave as Christians in words, and if we only seek the right and proper words about God and live the right and proper deeds about God, then we've solved the problem. That's delusion. We never get to that point. So I'm seeing on this day of the Holy Trinity, Nicodemus coming and scratching his head. He probably had more hair than I do to see Jesus and ask these questions that he asked that we read today. But as Jesus told Nicodemus, God is always behind, beyond our intellectual comprehension. Beyond it. The reality of God is really like the truth of God is never beyond our experience. Maybe beyond our comprehension, our intellects, but not beyond our experience. And having said that, I will add, that's what the whole Bible is really about. About God. The reality of God is experienced by God's people as being real. That God has saved them over and over. That God forgives all this 
mess that we make of things that God loves us without end. What's the proof of that? We can say it over and over, but the real proof is when we actually experience I am loved. All is forgiven. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, now we can talk about a couple of brilliant theologians. One was St. Augustine, who wrote the famous Confessions. And this brilliant church father was always trying to figure God out. This is He was a young man who became a convert. He was... This, here's a apocryphal, I'm sure, story, but it's a really cool story about St. Augustine. Walking the beach one day, as he always did, contemplating the mystery of the Holy Trinity. I got to figure this out. And then he saw a little boy in front of him digging a hole in the sand and then going out to the sea again and again with a bucket, coming back with a bucket, dumping water in it, running back out, getting more water, coming back, dumping the water into the sand, and Augustine's, Augustine said to him, what are you doing? I'm going to pour the entire ocean into this hole, said the little guy. Well, Augustine said the obvious, this is impossible. The whole ocean will not fit into this little hole in the sand that you've made. And the little boy replied, and you cannot fit the Trinity into that little tiny brain of yours. <laughs> the story concludes by saying, after saying that, the boy vanished. Augustine had been talking to an angel. So goes that story. Well, that's a clever little story, is it not? A great picture back and forth with the bucket. You want to get to the beach and start pouring water? A parabolic attempt to convey the depth or cosmic expanse of what is meant by the concept of the Holy Trinity, that is, God. Augustine confesses that he was a, he knows he's a brilliant thinker, and he spent years and years writing books. He wrote 15 books concerning the Trinity. 15 but confessed that the most profound and essential truth was the presence of God as God. The Holy Trinity, love and mercy beyond mere intellectual conception. Thus he wrote the famous line in the Confessions that has been repeated over and over by hundreds of thousands of preachers and teachers. This line from the Confessions, our hearts are restless, Lord, until they come to rest in you. That's a whole different thing than trying to figure, figure everything out about God and nailing down your theology and doctrine until you get it just perfect. None of that matters ultimately. What matters is resting in God. I think of Psalm 131. I can't remember it all right now, but I remember the most important part. It's about, I do not think great things, O God. I do not try to understand things above my comprehension, but I am content to be with you like a little toddler is in its mother's arms. That's me resting in you. O Israel, rest in the Lord now and forever. Beautiful psalm. 131. Now, Augustine isn't alone. There's a whole history of Christians who write about their various experiences with God. There is another great, great medieval theologian that Catholics just love, St. Thomas Aquinas, wrote massive volumes of high, highly detailed theology. Guess what? He, after written all this, writing all this theology, he had a vision or experience of God, a mystical experience, so that it changed his understanding of everything, that he, so, so much so that he never wrote another book. <laughs> Point taken. Didn't write another book. And here's what I say. 
knowing about God is one thing, and that's a good thing. But knowing God is all to better. Way better. Now, if we pay attention, I think we notice in our experience of daily life that this is true. We discover many things about God, and our faith is found in many different ways. We actually, if our eyes are open and we are trying to rest in God instead of trying to figure everything out, we will discover the beauty of nature around us, the kindness of people in a shopping aisle at the local supermarket, the kindness of people everywhere, the beautiful, beautiful words written, beautiful music, like we heard this morning about the Holy Trinity. Everywhere, God is. Can we see God like that? Instead of agonizing, trying to figure everything out, just see God with us here. What are you? You're God here, known as the body of Christ in the world. Here you are. Hello, God. <laughs> yes. So, if we pay attention, we'll notice these things in our daily lives. It's like we enter into the realm of the mystery of God in the mundaneness of our lives. And it breaks through and we just stand in awe, wonder, gratitude. And of course we know the reality is not all a bed of roses. There are heartbreak in life as we started our service this morning with actually. A prayer to God about all the people who have been lost due to war or illness or accident. It can be rough. Does that mean we're abandoned by God? No. God is with us in all things. That's our faith. And if we are consistently believing that, not trying to figure it all out, just trusting that, then we encounter what Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled, started with the first, the very first sentence of the book, life is difficult. Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, life is difficult. And then he goes on to say, but once we can accept that as a reality and quit fighting against it, suddenly life is not difficult anymore in the sense that we were trying to argue over everything. If we can accept it, trusting in God, life is good. So Paul confessed this in Romans 8. It's an incredible chapter in the book of Romans in the New Testament. When facing the troubles and sufferings of us and of the cosmos, the chaos and the heartbreak of our lives and world, he writes, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. How about that? The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. What? We don't even know how to pray? <laughs> but that very Spirit intercedes for us in sighs too deep for words. Think of that. The Holy Three and the Holy Spirit prays for us. Always. In sighs too deep for words deeper even than our groans of suffering. Such beautiful, comforting words. God prays for us. Think about that. That's how loving and close God is. So this is why Jesus said in this section of John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that ever, whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. What's eternal life? It's not just what happens after we die. It's life now. In John's gospel, eternal life means life with and in God. That's the miracle. We're already in God and God is in us. If God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, too much condemnation going on all the time. And we all know that people don't change their lives they're being hollered at. It doesn't happen like that. 
So, from beginning to end, this is the kind of thing that Jesus is about. And as I said earlier, this is what the whole Bible is about. The faithfulness, the steadfast love of God. Like Nicodemus, we might try to replace uh, actual faith with intellectual discussions and, and topics about God. That's all interesting, but that's not what the church and the Bible is really about. It's about in the midst of tragedy and suffering and joys as well, God is there. God cares. So we can end up avoiding God's love. How about that? I sometimes wonder if a lot of our arguing, discussing, disappointment is about trying to avoid God because if we take God real seriously, maybe something will change in us, in our life. One of the most beautiful things I've run across is this. Justus Gonzalez, a Methodist theologian, wrote this. And the first line is certainly true. The Trinity is a mystery. Can you agree with that? The Trinity is a mystery, not a puzzle, which is where I started. Trying to figure everything out. Which piece goes where? A puzzle. No, that's not what it is. Love is a mystery, he says. A crossword is a puzzle. You try to solve the puzzle, but you stand in awe before a mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy. Amen.
we join with congregations around the world to confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we join with the church in every place, praying for the world that God so loves. Abba, when we cry to you, your spirit bears witness with our spirit. Give to your church the confidence of the children of God so that we boldly share with everyone your world-saving love. Hear us, O oh God. The whole earth is full of your glory. Cities teem, fields flourish, mountains soar, and waters abound. Blot out our sin of spoiling your creation. Send us to go for you, mending what is torn and tattered in your world. Hear us, O oh God. You so love the world that you gave your only son. In these days when nations condemns nation, save us. Give us strength and fill us with your justice and peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your people cry out to you, seeking the goodness of hope of your holiness. Let the wind of your spirit blow into the lives of all who suffer from injustice, want, or anguish of any kind. Hear us, O oh God. In our living and in our dying, we belong to you. In loving remembrance, we honor those who live with scars or have died defending our nation. Beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, and teach us your ways. Hear us, O God. We pray for members and friends of Calvary, Dorothy, Carl, Carol, Brian, Kenneth and Kay, Carolyn, Deborah, Joe, our partners in ministry, Christ Lutheran Church, our Savior's Lutheran, Emmanuel Lutheran, Lutheran Church of Arcata, Grace Good Shepherd, Bayshore Light, Reverend Jeff Johnson, Sierra Synod Bishop, ELCA, Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. With affection, we remember the saints now departed and rejoice in their faithfulness. Through their example, provoke us to holy lives of loving service in your name. Hear us, O God. By the sure guidance of your Holy Spirit, O God, we lift up our prayers in trust and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world for the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen.
together we make the sign of the cross with two words of sorrow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy, living, and loving God, we bring you thanks to Jesus, who, living among us, healed the sick and fed the hungry. <laughs> The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup thanks and gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Remembering, therefore, his life giving death and glorious resurrection, he lives your promised life for all who have died in the world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death into life. That we may live. Him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come.
please stand? May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our post meeting.
Zoomers, please unmute. Go in peace. May God's love be known. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Thanks, everyone. Beautiful service. Love you, Marie.